Drills were an important piece of Stone Age technology. Creating holes in objects, whether eyes and needles, holes in tool handles for wrist loops, holes in basketry, and much, much more, this is an essential type of tool. While flint drills can be twisted by hand, simple mechanical tools can make this process much more efficient. In this video, we create a pump drill, one of several types of Stone Age drill designs, all using stone tools. First, we begin with cutting the spindle. As the drill bit and all other pieces connect to this, the other components will be proportioned based on the dimensions of this spindle. The wood I'm using is actually a piece of an old flint napping tool that is nice and straight, making it perfect for this component. Using a biface, I saw all around the circumference until I have a good groove, and then snap the wood to separate it. Our second wooden component is the cross piece. The wood for which I'm using was part of a pile of branches dumped by the side of the road. I begin by splitting a large branch in half using a wedge made from moose antler. The spindle will fit through a hole in the center of the cross piece and attach by a cord to the top of said spindle, ultimately providing the torque for spinning the drill by pumping up and down. I begin some of the shaping using an ads, a woodworking tool with a horizontal cutting bit. However, I quickly realize I can save some time thinning the cross piece by splitting off some of the wood again using the wedge. I then continue with an adz to shape it and thin it down. I want to make this somewhat thin and flat as we will need to create a hole through the center of the cross piece, which will be much easier to do the thinner it is. When the wood is rough shaped, I use a flint side scraper to plane and smooth the wood, further refining the shape. Now, it is time to start boring the hole in the center. I take a flint flake and work one end of it into a drill, leaving the other wide so that I might grasp it more easily to twist the drill by hand. The difficulty involved in this highlights my need for making a pump drill to begin with. Boring a hole by hand with flint tools takes a lot of time and effort. As this flint drill is tapered, it makes a conical hole in the cross piece. And once it pierces through to the other face, I flip the cross piece over and begin to drill back through the other direction so that I can make the inside of the hole a consistent diameter. Once I've widened this hole enough to make the spindle pass through without rubbing against the cross piece, I can begin the last modifications. Using a flint flake, I worked to have toothy protrusions. I cut grooves into each end. This is to accommodate the end of the string, which will fit into the top of the spindle. In order to provide downward pressure and provide mass to help spin the spindle, we need to fashion a weight. A piece of shale is both nearly the right shape and easily worked. I grind the shale on a piece of sandstone the gritty surface acting like a file or sandpaper to shape the stone into our weight. Water and sand combined together on the surface of the sandstone block adds more grit, allowing me to easily shape the soft piece of shale into a disc shape. Again, we need to drill through the center of this to fit the weight onto the spindle, near where the bit is going to be. I make another flint drill for this task, this time using a speedily shaped biface rather than a flake. I twist this drill by hand until breaking through the opposite face, and then drill through the opposite direction to make the hole wider. Our pump drill, importantly, needs a drill bit in order to drill holes through various materials. I start with working a piece of blocky Fort Payne shirt from Southern Kentucky. This isn't a particularly high quality piece of the stone, but the tougher the stone for the drill, the better to keep it from snapping. I use a hammer stone to remove the earliest flakes from this piece of chert, though I will soon switch to an antler billet to continue thinning. Since we are starting with a blocky piece of stone, one of my first priorities is to remove the squared edges. As I remove the majority of these, I can focus on thinning the blade and shaping the profile narrower. I want the blade to be somewhat thick to lend it additional strength, 
as it will be spinning at high speeds as a drill and long narrow pieces of flint tend to snap easily. However, I do need it to be somewhat thin, particularly where it will attach to the spindle, to make the hafting process easier. As the drill becomes thin and too narrow for me to strike off flakes with the antler billet, I switch to an antler pressure flaker. Pressure flaking is a much more controlled technique, even if the flakes it removes are fairly small. This control allows me to make the drill blade a consistent thickness and have a smooth edge, which is important to avoid friction and to be able to drill with precision. With our drill finished, it is time to come back to our spindle. Using toothy edged flint flakes, I saw a groove or notch into the end to accommodate the drill bit. While I made the bit first and am shaping the wooden half to fit it, replacement bits will be thinned and shaped to fit the wooden half instead. Into the opposite end of the spindle, I cut a shallower groove to accommodate the string. Now we are ready to half the flint drill bit to the wooden spindle. To do this, I will use both glue and fibrous materials to secure it in place. The glue I'm using is called pine pitch, made from pine tree sap, charcoal, and beeswax, or other materials. I spread this on both the wooden haft and the base of the drill, and when joined, fill in all the gaps with it. Once that glue cools and sets, I use deer sinew to bind the drill in place. The last step is to make the string. For this drill, I'm simply going to cut a simple cord of bikeskin another name for deer leather. Using a super sharp obsidian flake, I gently cut around the perimeter of the rounded buckskin section, doing my best to keep the thickness of the leather consistent as the cord will only be as strong as the thinnest point. That accomplished, I tie the string to the cross piece and fit the middle into the top of the spindle. Now the pump drill is ready for use. Winding the string around the spindle and pushing it down, the drill is twisted and the momentum winds the string back around the spindle, readying the drill for the next pump. Done with enough force and control, I can keep the drilling motion going continuously. Drilling against both wood and antler to test it, the drill is much more comfortable and efficient than drilling by hand. I'm pleased with the results, and will not only be using this pump drill for future projects on this channel, but also for public educational displays. Thank you for joining me as we made a pump drill, just as people in the Stone Age would have done.